Good afternoon. I'll tell you, it's been, I've really been enjoying this camp meeting here. Uh, it's been a lot of uh, fun. We've been able to work with the young people. We've been mostly over in the chapel there working with the youth. Um, it's been exciting to have them see and experience missionary work. Some of them have been doing door-to-door -door work in the, in the town of Caribou. Uh, yesterday we took them out and we did some activities where we were, th the, the theme for the, the week is forgotten heroes. And, uh, and so yesterday we went to the hospital and at the shift change of the janitor service, we, we gave gifts to the janitors telling them thank you for their good work. You should have seen the surprise on their faces. Never have they ever been thanked for cleaning the hospital, but they've got a really important job, don't they? Sure. And they went to the utilities department and thanked the people at the utilities department. See, nobody really thinks about what they do until you don't have water if you live in town. And then if it doesn't work, then everybody remembers, hey, the guy who fixes all this stuff is really key. And so it was kind of fun to be a blessing and just to say thank you. And in that little thank you package came a Steps to Christ and an invitation to, to a dinner, a free dinner at the Caribou SDA Church. So I'm curious to see, I think we gave out probably 30 or 40 of those little gift packages there, some of the teams. <clears throat> so I'm kind of excited to see next Friday, how many of those make it to the Caribou Church for a little invitation. You know, missionary work, it, it, mission work happens all over the, no matter where you are. Mission, being a missionary is a, a lifestyle. Ellen White says in Desire of Ages that every child is born into the kingdom of God as a missionary. We're all missionaries. Now, my wife and I, my family, some of you have seen some of my children running around here. Uh, we live in Belize. I work at a, a, a missionary training center called MOVE. It's kind of unique. I've uh, been involved with different uh, uh, missionary training centers. Some of them have different focuses. All of them are wonderful. Uh, Eugene has one in Malaysia, and I, I know of several here across the, the states. Of course, Eugene, I was just visiting with him a little bit. He, he's, he's pioneered several schools in, 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 the, in the past years, and uh, one of those schools is one of the things that got me involved in the Adventist Church. So I want to say that Eugene was instrumental through his, the people, his followers, you might say, his converts, were one of the tools that God used to make a big change in my life. I actually came back into the church through literature evangelism. And uh, in, in, in Belize, I, uh, I teach mechanics and I teach evangelism. I teach both those classes there. We have, it's kind of a unique school in that it, uh, it's, it's, you've got to be 18 years or older to go there. It's a three-month training uh, program. The young people come, they, they take general classes such as evangelism, uh, mission, about three different mission classes, they have practical skills, and then they pick um, one of five electives. And one of those is mechanics, construction, agriculture, health, or education. They can pick one of five, and then they go serve all the world. I've got some brochures there in the back somewhere. Uh, and you're welcome, or ask me if you want to know more information about that. The reason that I ended up starting that school. I worked for nine years in Bolivia uh, directing an aviation program and working with high school and at the high school that I worked at I had over a hundred and forty volunteers go through that school. A lot of them post-university graduates and I gotta tell you I realized that they need just a little bit more training. In fact more and more in the states we've gotten toward a a very intellectual focus, but they haven't got a very good work ethic, many of the students that I've got there. Sad to say. Uh, a lot of them never have, you know, they don't know anything about practical anything. Now, I grew up in, as a farm, you know, country boy. My dad was a mechanic. So when I went to the mission field, a lot of those things weren't too difficult. And funny thing is, is that move, we, we, we uh, the training, for example, give you an idea, my, my American boys, we have Latin American uh, students, it's, the classes are bilingual, my American, I had one student come and he did not know to put soap in the washer machine. Was there two weeks? Took him a little bit to figure that out. We have apartments, I don't have, uh, I don't have dorms, I don't have cafeteria, these guys have got to, they've got to cook on their own, it's all part of class. See, I find that the classroom is a lot bigger than just four walls, and I try and make the whole experience an educational experience. So these guys, they live in four-bedroom, four-bathroom apartments, but uh, I don't have a cafeteria, so they got to cook together. 
and uh, they got to make a menu, they got to make a budget for the food, they got to go shop for their own food, and you've got Colombians, you've got Mexicans, you've got Americans, you know, and the Mexicans like spicy food, the Colombians, you know, they don't like spicy food, Americans like, you know, oatmeal a certain way, the Latins eat an oatmeal another way, and they, you know, it's a whole cross-cultural training right there in their own dorm room, you know. And then uh, financial management, how do you do with, what do you do when you have and someone doesn't, someone else doesn't have? You know, you've got a Venezuelan that comes there and their money's worth nothing. You know, the, the course costs $350, is, I, that, that's more or less the, for them. We don't charge a tuition. Basically how we do it is uh, we offer the program for free on condition that they go serve someone for a minimum of six months. And, uh, but they gotta pay their own visas and they gotta pay for their own food. How much does the food cost? Well, it depends on how you wanna eat, you know? Because the local food is a little bit cheaper then if you want to buy American food, you can buy American food in Belize, but it's not so cheap. And so, uh, and, and, and there's all these dynamics happening. You know, these guys, they don't know, necessarily know how to cook so well. So, uh, you know, they're always excited when the one that knows how to cook, it's his turn to cook. And, uh, you know, well, you might forget to cook. Well, what happens if you forget to cook? Well, eight guys go hungry. They're not too happy with you, <laughs> you know? And so a lot of times we've kind of, in, in our American culture, we've kind of shelter people from the consequences of their decisions. And I don't do that there. Well, if you make a bad decision, I, well, I guess you're going to go hungry. I don't know what else to do for you. But maybe next time you'll be a little more motivated to, to follow through with your end of the deal. Or you, The other thing is, is education is not forcing information on an unreceptive mind. I, was a, I didn't like school. And so if it wasn't applicable, if I couldn't, you know, apply the information, boy, it was very difficult for me to retain it. But I'll tell you what, when you go hungry a couple meals and you eat this half-cooked beans or half-cooked rice, all of a sudden your motivation to pay attention in the practical skills class about cooking increases. You know, everybody's a little more motivated. Yeah, because, you know, hey, this is pertinent information. How to make rice in just a few minutes with a pressure cooker all of a sudden has some meaning. And so what, I, what I'm finding is, is that especially in America, we are, we are, our blessings uh, for our young people are turning into a bit of a curse. And, uh, and I used to think that America was ahead of the rest of the world. In fact, America is blessed. You have no idea how blessed we really are. I mean, to think of how young our country is and how far we've advanced and it's all because we're Protestants. And people say, really? Yes. You know, you don't have burglar. How many of you have burglar bars on your windows at home? I've done, nobody has burglar bars. I grew up and I left my house unlocked. In fact, I know people here in Maine who do the same. They're here and their house is unlocked. Well, you don't do that everywhere else. Why? Well, you're gonna, they're gonna, they're, people there, the rest of the world, aren't Protestants. They don't have the ability to govern themselves. So the, the, the civilians live in jail and the thugs go free. That's what I tell them. You know, you live in, you build your own jail and you lock yourself in at night and you can't go out. Now, of course, America, that's changing some, isn't it? But our young people, because we wanted everybody to have a better life and these kind of things, they're, they're, they're losing their ability to govern them. So the farther we get from God... And that's sad. But anyway, it's exciting. Uh, the training there is very practical. Uh, the young people are learning a lot of skills. I've got some of our students, for example, this summer. This summer's been kind of a busy summer, but I had one of our students uh, built the first, did our first mission trip to Colombia to build a church. Now, Colombia doesn't receive too many foreign missionaries. Uh, you know, of course, I mean, when you say Colombia, what do you think of? Drugs, you think of drugs, you think of guerrilla warfare, and you think of kidnappings and lots of things. You know, people, I, you fly in Colombia, I fly over Colombia, and uh, it sounds kind of scary. And so people haven't been doing much mission. Colombia needs churches desperately, and we did our first pioneer. Uh, they just, uh, two students from Mu with a bunch of locals, uh, nationals from Colombia, built uh, the, the first uh, church there in a long time as far as a foreign mission church. It was really exciting. Uh, the union, I just spoke with the union president there just a few weeks ago, and he was really blessed by it. And he asked me, can you build a hundred more? hundred more, yeah. Uh, have you ever built a church? Any of you guys ever been on a mission trip? Now, I, I've been on a mission trip, and I've, I've built several churches. My dad goes every year. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. 
But it takes quite a little bit of work to, you know, I, I, I myself, it, the best, the most block I've ever laid in one day is 500. That's my record. And I thought I was going to keel over. 500, yeah, that's a lot of block. And my, my best student can lay, well, he can lay about 450. But, you know, that's 100 churches. You know how long it would take me to build 100 churches if I myself went? It would still take me a really long time. And uh, I think, well, what I need to do is we need to be training other people to be able to do that. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. And, and that is the, the, the truth of the story. We need workers. And we need workers that are willing to work. That's why the school is called MOVE, Missionary Outreach and Volunteer Evangelism. I preached a sermon uh, at the Caribou SCA Church that I entitled, If You're Just Sitting There, Get Worried. If you're just sitting there, get worried. You know, because a lot of people are just sitting down. And uh, I won't have time to preach that sermon. Maybe they recorded it someday. If you get a chance, listen to it. Uh, but we teach, in, in, my, in my evangelism class, I teach these young people, I teach them how to share Christ. Now, I've got to tell you, I have a, I have a, a pr- perspective that everyone, every child in the, is, in the, is born into the kingdom of God as a what? As a missionary. So mission work isn't just an event, it's a lifestyle. And what you're doing, Jesus says he mingled with the people, right? I think probably someone's heard this quote this week here, because if Dr. Simon's here, he was the one who taught me this quote, and I bet you he said it this week. What was Christ's method? Does anybody know? No? Did Christ's method alone will have true success with the people? He mingled with the people as one who desired their best good, Right? And he met their needs, he won their confidence, and then bid them follow me. And you know, so we do things like mechanics clinics. I take my students out to the villages and we fix junk for, for like four days straight. And, and you know, from those events, I've spoken multiple churches of not our denomination. I'll work in the Catholic school, I'll work on the Baptist church, I'll fix the Baptist minister's car, I'll fix the rich, the poor, it doesn't matter. I will serve, I, I, we serve them all the same. Last, last month in May, we, fixed over, we, we registered over 100 pieces of equipment that we, we serviced in, in just four days. It's, it's a marathon. And who would think just mechanic? This is, this is, but I, we do it because it reaches out to a specific group of people, by the way, men. The guys are the ones who bring all their chainsaws and weed eaters and lawnmowers. Anyway, it's a way to minister to people. As we're, as we're about our daily duties and we're looking for opportunities like noble farmer, to connect with people, to win their confidence. And one of the best ways to win their confidence is when you help someone, they realize that you have their best interest in mind. And when they come to that realization and you serve them, the things that you say have more meaning. It's not just information. A lot of times information, you, you, you'll try and convince someone, but it just they have deaf ears. But when they understand that what you say, you really care about them, the words that you say have more impact. And so, and so those are methods that we, we do health expos, we do, we do children's programs, we have pathfinders, we do mechanics, anything I can possibly think of to connect and mingle with people, we do it. And then someone asked me a question once. They said, Jeff, I mean, all those things that you do, they're neat ideas. But what would you do in America? What would you do in America where no one needs anything? Have you ever thought of that? I started to think about that. I was like, that's kind of a problem. What do you do when no one needs anything? Well, and, and yes, we, we kind of, we, you know, we've got a fix for it. We've got insurance. We've got welfare, we've got all these social systems, and so the opportunity to meet something in need of someone is totally different. And I ask myself, well, what did God do? How do you reach the wealthy? And I began to analyze this story, and as I was praying this afternoon, I, what am I going to tell my brethren from my own country what message could I share with them this afternoon? And, and uh, the Lord put this on my heart. I want you to go to Matthew chapter 19. Now I want to tell you, I'm going to give a little disclaimer here at the beginning. As we study this, 
There is no recipe and nothing applies to absolutely everybody in the same exact way. Sometimes we want to take a statement that somebody says and say, well, in this case, we're, it has to be. Uh, we're going to look at some principles here, and, you, and, and the Holy Spirit's going to have to apply these a little different for everybody, okay? So, in Matthew 19, Jesus has an encounter with someone who's wealthy. In verse, Matthew 19, verse 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? You know, there was someone who had the, the, this, uh, this, it says one, and, and, and first the, the, the title above it says the rich young ruler. It's this, the story of the rich young ruler. And he says, what shall I do that I may have eternal life? He sensed a need of something, but he couldn't figure out exactly what it was. He felt like he lacked something. And Jesus said unto him, why callest me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, into eternal life, or enter into life, keep the commandments. Fairly simple, right? Do you think most Adventists could fall into this group? Do you think the Adventists could respond the same way that the rich young ruler responded? Yeah. And, he, and, he, and, and of course he feels good about the first question. And he saith unto him, Which? Thou shalt no, do no murder, thou shalt not steal, thou commit adultery. No, I'm sorry, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and mother, and love thy neighbor as himself. He mentions the last one. But he leaves a few out, doesn't he? It's interesting. And the young man said unto him, All of these things I have kept. He, notice he mentioned, he doesn't mention the first four, and he doesn't mention the last one. Am I right? I don't see covet in there. Commit adultery, steal, bear false witness, honor thy father and mother, love thy neighbor as thyself. Doesn't mention covet, and it doesn't mention the first four. And the young man said unto him, All of these things I have kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? And Jesus' response is one that I've always kind of wondered about. Why did Jesus ask the rich young ruler to do the thing that he asked him to do? There's no commandment that says that you have to do this. He says, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. And this is why I want to make this disclaimer. Jesus did not say that same statement to Nicodemus. Isn't that interesting? But he says it to the rich young ruler. By the way, has anybody ever read Desire of Ages? How did Nicodemus die? Did he die a wealthy man? No, he didn't. Nicodemus didn't have the same problem. But Jesus, to this rich young ruler, gives a piece of advice that's very difficult for us to understand sometimes. He says, go and sell what you have and give to the poor. Money. You know, the, having resources, being blessed with things, is a blessing and a curse. You see, that, that same problem we, we even heard a little bit about this morning, the Laodicean church were rich and have need of nothing. Oftentimes, our dependence isn't on God, but is on what? Our money. You know, now I want to I want to make this statement. I have never met a rich person who feels rich. I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand. Does anybody feel rich in the audience today? All right, good. We got two brave souls that answer their, raise their hands. Most of us don't feel rich, right? Why? Because the amount of money that we have and the amount of bills that we have, normally the bills somehow feel like they're greater than the income, and we always feel like we're just barely making it to some level, right? In other words, well, maybe we're not barely making it, 
but we're, you know, definitely not like we can just give it away without no pain, right? I remember I said this to a, a man a month ago. His name is Carl. I, uh, he, he, he came and he gave me some flight instruction in an airplane I'm flying right now. And uh, I said, Carl, you know, I've never met a rich man who feels rich. And he's like, he's thinking to me, drives an old Mazda pickup. He's 75 years old. And he owns a Citation jet. You know what a Citation jet is? Well, that's a kind of expensive, probably a million and a half dollar, eh, maybe two million dollar jet. But that's not all he owns. He also owns the same kind of airplane I own. And that's, a, that's a, what we have in the ministry. And I bet maybe seven or eight hundred thousand. But that's not it. He owns two more airplanes. He owns two helicopters. And I know that Carl does not feel rich because, you know, you know what an airplane, the definition of an airplane is? It's a hole in the sky you throw money at. Just, just they're money pits. You know, and so he owns a bunch of money pits that he just throws money at like crazy. Carl doesn't feel rich, and I could th see Carl's brain kind of whirling around. He's like, yeah, you're right. Never met a rich man who, doesn't, who feels rich. And so Jesus makes this invitation to the rich young ruler to sell what he has and give to the poor. How do you reach the wealthy, was the question. Now to me, it seems like that wasn't a very good method to reach the rich young ruler, because why? What happened to him? He went away sad. He went away sad because he thought that it was a total loss that God was asking him to do. Now I want to share a little bit of my experience about money in the mission field. I made a deal with God 15 years ago that I would work for him if he would take care of my family. I believe that that's my responsibility of the husband. I've got, I started out with just my wife and I, and now I have three children, and I have a few that I've adopted here and there along the way, helped get through school. And, you know, as a, as a father of the home, we're the house band, we're the providers, and I believe that that's my God-given duty to provide for my family. I, uh, I graduated from Southern. Dr. Saman was my teacher. I had a call to be a youth director in Arizona Conference, and I decided to go as a missionary. I told them I'd only go one year because I made a deal with God. It'll be even before I made the deal that I'd work for him and him not pay me. I told them I wanted to go where no one else wanted to go. I wanted to work where, where there was a need. I, I didn't want to go where everybody else would go. And so uh, I had an opportunity to go to Bolivia and they asked me to start an aviation program and, and my journey with, with this faith experience began. And I got to tell you, that for an, I think human nature, it's very interesting how our relationship with God and money relate quite frequently. Uh, I, wanna, I don't want to say they're one-to-one -one or anything like that, but what I'm going to say is, is our financial assets, responsibilities, oftentimes if we have a need, well, we, we go see him quite more, we, we're talking to the Lord quite a little bit more about it, aren't we? Uh, and sometimes giving can be a little bit difficult. I don't, you know, it, it, it's funny how, how attached, is what I want to say, we are to money. It's, you know, people say, well, you know, money is very important. Is money important? Kind of. You'd say, well, I can't say that it just, if it doesn't exist, we can do things with it. It's, it's helpful. We got to have it to survive. So people value it quite a little bit. And uh, so... So my experience, I, I began to have to try and understand, well, what do I do? Uh, how do I relate to this whole money thing, God? How do you provide for me? And I began worrying about $100 a month. I, took, I sold the car. I took $5,000 down, down with me. And I said, God, all I need you to do is provide my basic needs for my wife and my family. So food, shelter, you know, education, clothes. I mean, the basic things we all have to have, right? I mean... I got to eat. And if you provide that for me, I'll work for you. That's all I'm asking. And you can figure out how you want to do it. You're God. Is he not? Can he figure that out? Well, that's, the Bible says that in Matthew chapter 6, and I just wanted to put it. He says, don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear or what you're going to put on. Your heavenly Father knows you need these things. 
But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And so I began to worry about $100. And then after that, they asked me to direct a high school full of young people who eat like horses. They are, you know, they're teenage boys. I got like 30 of them. My dad always told me, you know what a bad investment is? He says, a bad investment is anything that eats while you sleep. He says, that's why I don't own horses, but I made a mistake. I have children. He says, every time I come home and you open the fridge, it's 11 o'clock at night, you're always eating. You're a bad investment. Well, these boys were bad investments. Man, these guys can eat. And I, you know, I'm worrying. Now I gotta, I gotta figure out how I'm gonna pay it. Now it's a couple thousand dollars a month. And now the school, these kids are poor. They don't have any money. And I'm wondering, and, and you know, I go nine months and the Lord is providing. No one has went hungry. Now, I was a budget guy. The Lord blessed me. I made a deal with God when I went through school. Same thing. I would go to an Adventist college. My parents couldn't pay my way, but I didn't want to have debt. I don't do debt. I said, I'll go to Southern, but the day, the year I can't pay last year, I don't go back. The Lord was good. I went through debt free. Miracle after miracle, how that all worked out. But, you know, the, uh, I, I had to, you have to manage your money. And so I knew about budgets, and I knew about managing, and I thought, you know, I was telling the Lord, I shared this story a little bit in the Caribou Church, but m many of you haven't heard it. I told the Lord, you know, at the end of nine months, I said, you know, your method isn't so good. Have you ever, ever given God advice? I'm always giving God advice, you know. I tell him, hey, if you would send the money at the beginning of the month, it would work out a lot better. You know, I know, I, here's my budget, here's the food, here's the gas, this is what it costs. Just send it at the beginning of the month. This is stressful. You're killing me. I remember I was having my devotion. The Lord says, well, you know, you're crying about all this stuff. But what you, why don't you figure out how much money you're getting in? And so I sat down and opened up my computer program. And I took a, a total of all that I've gotten in the last nine months and divided by nine. Just took an average. Just a straight up average of how much I was getting in a month. How much do you think I was getting in a month? Well, I was getting, I was asking for 2,500 and I was getting 5,000. You know, when I read that number, I just kind of had to shut up. The Holy Spirit just, you know, the, the Holy Spirit, he knows how to talk to us sometimes. For me, sometimes it's a, it's a fairly large stick. Hey, quit your whining. You don't even know how much you need. You're whining about 2,500 bucks. I'm sending you 5,000. Let me worry about the money and you just work. Fair enough. Fair enough. And so that's what I began to do. And, and you know, I'll tell you, it's, it's an interesting money. Our wallets and a, our spiritual thermostats are related. And I want to show you how. Because as need comes up, and as our wallets are there, and we're thinking about giving, and I'm going I'm to just make this, this little disclaimer right here about giving. I was watching uh, the fall session and the treasurer report of the GC, and they were talking about how our tithing is a flat line. Flat. It's like a dead pulse. Doesn't go up, doesn't go down. I think that's disappointing. I think if it's a thermometer, it's like dead. I pay tithe. People always, there's always, there's all these kinds of arguments about what should you or shouldn't you. Listen, friends, don't give, send me your tithe. Send it to the church. The church has a mission. God set it up that way. We need to share the 10% and it's not ours. And people say, well, what if they use it wrong? I said, it's not my problem. Amen. That's theirs. It ain't my money anyway. That's God's. In fact, 10% isn't just God's. 100% is. None of it's yours. The minute we think that it's ours, who, who gave you the breath to earn it? It isn't ours. Anyway, that's a soapbox. But our thermometer about giving, you see, we kind of, our hands are like this all the time. Why? Because we don't feel rich. I mean, to cut a check is always painful, whether it's 10% or 5% or 2% or 1%. It's difficult. And, and I will tell you that even as a missionary, it's difficult. Why? Because people begin to look at you and they look at me and they say, wow. Well, Jeff, this guy has money. Who's his donors? Now, I got to tell you, I don't do any of the right things for fundraising. So I don't write newsletters. I don't, not that I think that any of this stuff is bad. It's just that I let God take care of that and I just do the work. 
And I just work for him. He's the boss, so he can figure out how he wants to pay for the job that he wants to get done. And so uh, I don't do any of the right things, so I don't go to the conventions. I, my church, my home church, is a dinky little, I mean, it's a very small little church in northern Michigan. There's 15 members. I'm still a member there. Actually, i got to confess, I'm, I actually, I'm cloned. I'm in members in two churches at the same time. I'm skewing the statistics, I think. I'm not sure. I had a hard time getting my membership figured out. You know, you get overseas and then try and get the communication from one place to another. Anyway, so uh, I, I pay tithe in two churches. Yeah, I support the Michigan Conference and I support the Belizean Union. That's how I do it. Anyway, so, so my church is a small church. They, most of the people are on Social Security. They don't send me money. I'm not, my family members aren't wealthy. I don't, I, they don't, my family doesn't support me. In fact, I, I try, I'd like to help my family more. And so, so all the recipes that people look at to say, well, this is how you, how you should support yourself. You know, but there's, there's a God in heaven who moves on people's hearts to help. He's the one who does it, not me. I've had money appear in my bank account. I've had money. God, you know, I know that God could write me a check every day if he wanted to, but he doesn't. In fact, one of the most difficult things for me as a, you know, I, I was independent at 14 years old. I bought all my own clothes. I started working. I went to college at 50. Anyway, long, long story, but I was proud of, of the fact that I didn't need anybody. I don't know, maybe there's some people here that struggle with that. You know, you don't need help. I don't need help. I don't need a handout. And then I went to living off of people helping me. That was difficult for me. You know, that was very difficult for me. Probably the most difficult part was not worrying about running out of money, but having to face the fact that I have to live off of the generosity of someone else. And I tell you, I, I, as, a, as a missionary, I take my job seriously. I work for the Lord, and I'm very well sure that I put in well over 40 hours a week. How could I imagine working for God less? He pays me. The question is, is what happens when all the other missionaries look at you and they say, well, man, you've got it. Can you, can you share? I remember an experience I... I didn't, want to, uh, I didn't want to help with a project. It was a media center, and I'm not a TV guy. So TV and media are wonderful things, don't get me wrong. But I'm a mechanic. I'm a country boy. I'm not a city guy. I lived in the bush in the hut, and this is wonderful. And then I moved to a city of a million and a half people, lived in a condo with five bedrooms, three bathrooms, and I, it was terrible. And then, and then the Lord asked me, well, can, will you help, will you help uh, develop this media center? And the donor who wanted to give made it a condition. He wouldn't help unless I helped with the construction. And I felt bad. I didn't want to. And another missionary, the Lord spoke through. He said, Jeff, you're selfish. Why do you only want to do your own project? You just don't want to help with anybody else. And I thought, oh, painful. And so I, the Holy Spirit convicted me. And I said, okay, yeah, I'll help. And I remember I began, I'll say, here's the deal. Half of you are going to raise the money here to do this project. It's about a $500,000 project. You guys are going to raise part of it. This donor is going to give the other part. And I'll just do the logistics. I'll help build. I'll try and bring in team people to, to, to build the building. It's a 17,000 square foot building. Big project. Two years. I wanted to start the school in Belize. I couldn't leave Bolivia until I finished it. And I said, well, Lord, I'll, I'll make that commitment. And I remember we get halfway through this project. We're getting down and we're getting ready to pour the floor. We need, I can't remember, 400 yards of concrete. And I remember the donor calling me on the phone. He says, Jeff, these guys have not raised the money. Are you going to raise money for this project? I said, what? Raise money for the project? That's not my problem. You know, the old Holy Spirit says, well, are you? Whose money is it? He says, I want you to call so-and-so. Call him. So-and-so? Well, you know, so-and-so is supposed to help me with my project in belief. <laughs> you see how that all works? And now you get a little thermostat about where Jeff's heart is. See, as people, we want to hold on to our own stuff. You know, we want to kind of protect it. We want to be the one, well, what if, you know, what if, I, a lot of times I hear people kind of talk about this project, they're not so good, and we, we kind of, we compete over the pie, and we think that there's only one pie, and, 
And, and God doesn't work that way. In fact, he, he puts us into situations to show us that really, are, are we selfish? Is it his work or is it our work? I remember I called. I said, yeah, okay, Lord. I'll let the person know about the opportunity. I'm going to share with them the need. And, you know, if they want to help, they can. I didn't ask them how much. I didn't tell them anything. And, you know, they wrote a $30,000 check. Wow. Praise God. And I've got to tell you, it was kind of painful. Because you think, well, that little pie, it just got smaller. Right? I'm just, I'm, I'm being honest with you because I want you to understand that how our hearts are tied up with money. You know, if I give to this project, what will happen? Or if such and such a project gets that, or if this church takes this wealthy member, or how are we going to do this? And we kind of are worried about all these things. And we look at our own budget and we think, well, I can't give that much. I got to tell you, I am blessed to have a legacy of men in my life that gave me an example of what sacrificial giving was all about. First, my father. My father was a mechanic. In fact, we were, we were, we were poor. We weren't, we weren't wealthy. Uh, and the reason that we weren't wealthy is because my dad invested everything that he had into the Lord's work. He put us, number one, into Adventist education when we were uh, in the small you know, primary school elementary school, and that was quite a, there's five of us kids, and then um, my dad was, oh, you know, if you ever had a church be, I, I hope, there, there's people like this in your churches, but they're always there. You know, you, you have some church activity, some building project, they're always there helping. My dad was that way, I remember as a kid all along, we built the gymnasium on the school, my dad was there. We built the addition on the church, my dad was there. They did the remodel, dad was there. Well, dad was self-employed, so he could be there. But the fact when he was there, you know, if you're self-employed, if you're working somewhere else, are you making money? No. So we didn't have a lot of extra money. My dad would go to Mexico every year to build churches. My dad still does that. We build five churches every, he builds five churches every year in Mexico. And it's amazing. I remember our family, to pay for the church building project, we would, we would make Christmas wreaths, Christmas wreaths and sell them. And uh, that was the way we would sponsor ourselves. And Dad did the chip, trip really cheap because he wanted to make it available for anybody to go. It was like $300. Anyway, I just, my dad was always one to sacrifice for the, for the Lord's work. And then I met my wife. And my wife's father, my father-in-law, was another man who, who left, lived an amazing life. My father-in-law was an amazing businessman. He had over 1,500 employees. I always told my wife she's spoiled rotten. Spoiled rotten rich girl. You know, because dad paid for school, dad gave her a car. But I want to tell you that her dad lived in a trailer. I always thought it was weird. You know, how, how can you have a business with 1,500 employees and live? And I mean, you know, you know what I'm, when I say a trailer, the house trailer, right? The ones that are like 12 feet, 13 feet wide, that, those ones. And you think, what is he doing in a trailer when he makes, well, I don't know what he made. And I remember that they, he had a big lawsuit and they went after him. They thought they were going to just take him to the bank. They, 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 anyway, it was, a, it was a big lawsuit. And you know what? When they, when they finally figured out, my father-in-law had no money. Every time, every dollar that he got, he gave it away. And it was amazing. And you would think, my father-in-law got prostate cancer. He died of prostate cancer about four years ago. And uh, I, rem I watched his whole business implode. I watched him. He didn't go bankrupt. I just watched him. He just closed every all the doors. He did lose his house. He lost a lot of things. A lot, you just you watched like Job. Everything get taken away. And you would see, well, see, that's what happens to a man who gives everything away. But you know what I watched also? I watched all the people that he helped come and bail him out. Come and help him out. 
gave him a place, helped him here, helped him there. I watched so many people. I just, it was amazing to watch. He was able to get all his kids through school. The Lord blessed him. And when he passed away, my, my mother-in-law, who's a widow, has a farm in Montana. She has a nice, she's set up nice. The Lord has taken care of her. God did not abandon my father-in-law and any of his responsibilities ever. I, I, I'm blessed because I've got to see that Example that legacy lived out before my life. You know, now as we, as we think in our lives here and we say, well, am I or am I not wealthy? I want to share with you a, a story of a Mexican widow. She was a house cleaner. She made a deal with God. She was struggling with her work and... Uh, wasn't going so well. She was living in the, in the poverty line, and she made a deal with God. God, listen, I'm, I'm in poverty, but I want to help your work, and what I'm going to do from here on out, if you will bless me, I will only use for my bare living necessities the money, and everything else you give me, I'm going to give to you. And so quickly, she, the next week, that next day, she got a phone call, you know, uh, Mrs. Lopez, would you come down and we'd like you to clean our house. Not a minute later, she gets another phone call. Well, you know, we really, we've got this situation. We're going to have this party. We'd like you to come over and clean our facility. Would you be able to come on Tuesday? And then the, the phone calls start coming in and she starts having tons of work. And she's, you know, she's older, but she says, Lord, give me the strength to work for you. And she goes out and she begins to clean the houses. She begins to clean up after the party. She begins to get phone calls and she's working all the time. And she, everywhere she goes, every house she goes at, she prays with the family and she tells them, you know, I am the Lord's missionary. I'm working for the Lord. And the Lord blesses her and people are coming into the church. And you know, the treasurer of the church, by the way, the treasurer... You know, whether you like it or not, has the thermometer right in front of him. How many people are giving in the church? You know, do we, do we tithe? It's kind of sad to know how many people don't give. The treasurer is surprised because this old, below the poverty line woman, she hasn't changed her house, she hasn't changed her lifestyle, is giving more than anybody else in the church. How? Absolutely. What are you doing? And she has to confess her secret. And people are like, you don't need to give that much. Stop! I can't. If I stop, I'll go back to poverty. You know, it's interesting, the Bible, it says here at the end of the story, what the young ruler missed out on is, I want to I wanna keep reading down, because we already read the text about the eye of the needle. He says, verily I say, verse 28, verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the, re let's see here, yeah, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit... In the throne of glory, you shall also sit upon the twelve thrones, judging the tribes of Israel. Every one that hath forsaken houses, brethren, sisters, father, mother, wife, children, lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. I am going to give away my most best fundraising secret right now to each one of you. If you want to have more money to give, Use what you have. I want to tell you, when I left Bolivia and I, I, and I moved to Belize, I was discouraged. And in Bolivia, I'd been there nine years. I started out with nothing. No airplanes, no equipment. I'm a builder. I'm a, I, like, I like equipment. I, I'm an I'm a equipment fanatic. I like tools, machines. Dump trucks, backhoes, power trowels, scaffold. I mean, I got to build a lot of stuff. I don't want to do it with just a hole. We got a lot of work to do. And by the time I was there nine years, you know, I'd built three houses and people, I, I had the fridges and the, and the Vitamix and the Champion Juicer, the food dehydrator. The Lord had blessed me. 
And, and my wife had a small car. I, that was part of the deal with God. I was like, you know, God, my wife's American. My wife needs a little car. So she got a little Nissan Sentra. She's got a little Jeep Cherokee and Belize. Anyway, that's a long story. But we had all the stuff. I had the motorcycle. I have four airplanes. I've got the hangar. I've got the backhoe. I've got the dump truck. I've got the triple axle trailer. I've got the block machine. i got the stuff. And now I'm going to leave Belize, Bolivia and I'm going to move to Belize. You ever moved? Anybody here moved? You, know, you don't know how much junk you got till you got to move. And then all of a sudden you get the semi that comes up and you try and pack a semi full of junk. And you're like, wow, I didn't know I had all this stuff. Well, if you want to reduce the amount of junk, move in an airplane. <laughs> yeah, I told my wife you get 100 pounds. 100 pounds. She didn't kill me. I have the most amazing wife in the world. The Lord has blessed me. You, now you, you're going you're gonna, to, my wife will be a whole notch higher in your eyes because she's a saint in mine. She survived me for 15 years. She's ready for translation. The only reason the Lord hasn't come yet is because of me. Uh, she said, that's all right. I said, I don't know when we're going to come back. I was kind of discouraged. I moved back up to the States, and we, I, I, moved, I, I wasn't moving to the States. I was to load a container to ship to Belize, and we're starting all over at nothing. I prayed to the Lord. I said, Lord, give me a resort. You know, why don't you just, I'm, I'm getting old. I'm tired of building, you know. I, I don't want to do 500 blocks a day again. That's, that's a lot of work. And you know what the Lord gave me? He gave me an old cane farm. Just a flat piece of dirt with jungle on it. Not one thing. Not one structure, not one building, not one piece of nothing. Just bush. He gave it to me. It was a beautiful piece of land in the eye of a beholder, the Lord. I felt like the guys who went to Madison. Anywhere but here, Lord. You know, they didn't want to get off the boat. If you ever read the Madison story, these guys are going cruising around with Ellen White. And Ellen White's like, oh, we like this farm. And they're like, no, that's a terrible farm. I think I'm going to grow nothing. And she's like, no, really, this is the place. And they're like, no, no, we'll stand about. Why don't you go check that out? And she goes and checks it out on her own. And they finally convinced these poor guys, Sutherland and Spaulding and Megan, to get involved with this thing. Anyway, that's kind of how I felt. I'm like, ah, now from nothing, starting all over again, having nothing. You know, now I, you know, I, I don't have any money, I don't have any tools, I don't have, where's my backhoe, where's my... And uh, anyway, I want to tell you something to make a really long story really short. In three years, in three years, we had over 20,000 square foot of buildings built on that piece of property. I have an and I, I want to tell you, I am spoiled by God. I sold my airplane, I sold all my stuff, I thought I'd never fly again, I thought I'd never... I thought I was just ruined forever because I gave it all away. You cannot outgive God. You know, I, I've, got, I've got a shop and I have a, you know, you ever, have you ever heard of the one day church? You ever heard of that? I have a machine that makes that. Yeah, right there in Belize at my shop. I built the whole school out of metal stuff. God gave me that machine. He didn't give it to me. I bought it. It was $30,000. But he, I, it's not my I don't. Where am I going to make $30,000? I don't make it. I don't go to ASI. I don't, I'm not part of OCI. I don't, I don't know the McKees. I don't know McNeilis. I don't know these people. I'm not in any of those food chains. But God knows. God has a bigger food chain. He's got a line that he hands out stuff like crazy, and he puts it on people's hearts. I have a backhoe in Belize. I've got a tractor in Belize. I've got a MIG. I've got a TIG. I've got compressors. I've got tools. I've got a lathe. I teach all these things to the kids. You can't outgive God. And when I sold all my airplanes, you know God gave me another one. Not just any airplane, an airplane that can cross the Atlantic. But we sit there and we hold on to our stuff and we think the poor rich young ruler, how could God ask him to give everything away? How terrible. How cruel. He didn't ask Nicodemus that. 
He wouldn't ask me to do that. Friends, he's not asking you to curse you. He's asking you to bless you. He wants to bless us. There's such a wonderful work to do. As Americans, we're blessed. We have resources that no one else has. I was in Cuba, and I ate dinner with a pastor. Do you know how much pastors make in Cuba? They make $19 a month. How do you survive on $19 a month? You don't. You can't, not even in Cuba. And I ate dinner, and the lady at the house, she comes out and she prepares us a plate, and she says, i got to confess something to you. In my kitchen, there's a tank of gas. You know the propane ones? It's about that tall. And I ate dinner on this gas, and she says, I've never filled it in eight years. I ate food prepared on angel gas. We have so much, but we hold on like this. Friends, I want to encourage you, if you want to receive God's blessing, if you want to see where your heart is, if you want to see where Jesus is, you know, Jesus left it all. He doesn't, you know, know, we talked about tests and things about Sunday and, and all these things. You know, money is a test. He gives it to us. Are we going to share it or are we going to keep it? It's a test. It's difficult. Human nature has a hard time letting go. We're like this. It doesn't matter if you have $5 or $5 million. We all have the same problem. And what what did God do for the rich young ruler, the one who had it all? He gave him the opportunity to give. Friends, as the opportunities come in your path, this is why there's no recipe. God is going to send different tests at each one of you at different times. Different opportunities to give. Are we going to open our hands and give, or are we going to hold on? And let me tell you, if you want to experience the power of God in your life, give! Do it! Share it! Live it! You'll see that God will bless you back. Don't miss the opportunity like the rich young ruler. He missed out. He saw it was this terrible thing, and I couldn't let it, he couldn't let it go. But what he didn't know was behind it was a hundredfold promise to have more. Not only in this life, in the life to come. My wife and I, we live by that. I, I live just for what we need. That's it. Everything else is his. People ask me, well, do you do industries? Yeah, I do, but I work for God, so what happens to the money? I mean, if, if, I'm, if you work for an employer, you do a job and... You make him lots of money, what happens to it? Who does it go to? Well, the guy who pays you, right? Sure. So yeah, I do jobs. I I do kinds of things like that. But I don't keep it. It's not mine. I work for God. Friends, I just want to encourage you. God is doing great things around the world. Don't miss out. Don't miss out on the opportunity to be a part of it, to share, to give, to support our churches, to support the project. When needs come into your path, I don't know what the needs will come into your path. God's got all kinds of things planned out. I've had all kinds of things happen to me where someone shows up. I'll tell this last story to wrap up. Someone shows up at my door. Had a a shotgun. They had a booby trap. They hunt animals. They put a little uh, metal pipe, and they put a shotgun shell in a trip string, and he walked through his own booby trap, shot his knee out, filled his knee with a bunch of lead. Of course, there, you don't, have, you don't have welfare, you don't have things like that. So if you can't walk, you can't work, and it's kind of a straight line to poverty. And so he comes up, and I don't know how he found my office door in the city of a million and a half people, but he knocks on my door, and he asks me if I will help him get a surgery. It's $400. Now, you know, $400 is not a lot of money, but for me at that time, I was kind of broke. I don't know if I could, I didn't even, wasn't sure if I had $400, so I asked my accountant, do I have $400 right now? And she says, yeah, but Tuesday you got a bill for $400. It's Friday. You know, you see, when God puts needs in our paths, the question is, is they're tests, they're opportunities. And, and, and I said, well, today is Friday, Tuesday's Tuesday. God will figure out what to do with his bill on Tuesday. Today, we're going to pay the bill at my door. And my, my accountant is just scratching her head. She's like, you're crazy. Why are you doing this? You don't, 
You know, because a lot of times we can say, well, I just don't have the money. Well, I could say I don't have the money, but the reality is, is I do, but I got to spend it somewhere else on Tuesday. No, today I'll give you the money. I had to give her the money, help him get over to the hospital, get things set up, and we helped him. I don't even remember how I paid the bill on Tuesday, to be honest with you. I don't remember the rest of the story, but I know it got paid. God is able. So when the needs come across our paths, don't miss the opportunities to share. God will always give you back. He will give you back. Jesus is coming soon, friends. And I want to tell you that, that this test of money is for Laodicea. May God help us pass it. Gracious Lord, you are a great and awesome God. You own the cattle on a thousand hills. You do not need our money, but you need our hearts. You want us to trust you. You want us to have your spirit, that spirit of giving, of sacrificial giving. Lord, you want us to give even when it hurts. Help us be willing, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.